thank you so much for the introduction and the opportunity of being here today. So for the next 18 minutes, I'm going to challenge you to work with us on really engineering a future for the past. And as the title might give away, I'm an engineer by day. And uh, as an engineer, I really like pie. So that's the eatable variant. And my son, who's now five years old, just reminded me today that he'd really like to have a freshly baked pie for his birthday next week. But the one I'm talking about is really the pie that uh, is that universal mathematical constant, 3.1415, right? And you'll see pi throughout my entire talk. And my challenge to you is identify how many times pi actually occurs. It will be in disguise, right? So that's your challenge right there. So my talk will consist out of three parts and then a little bit more. But pi will emerge also later on when we're actually trying to make a really big point. And I'm going to challenge you to find that one as well. So, Let's start at the beginning. So imagine you were born and you grew up on an island, just as I did. That should be easy right now. So imagine an island that's, in my case, 161 kilometers offshore, that is nine, si nine times the size of Bermuda, but has 30 times the population. And having been in Bermuda traffic yesterday, rush hour traffic, you, you can't imagine what that means, right? So its capital was founded in 1100 which means it's culturally very, very rich and by very diverse. But that capital has grown over the years to consume that entire island. And it's now really a city-state. And as many islands, it actually has its own barrier, right? But rather than it being a reef, a seawall or the seashore itself, that barrier actually happens to be a wall, which is up to 3.6 meter tall, sizable, and 155 kilometers long. But now imagine that the island itself is not surrounded by an ocean, but by another country, one single other country. And that the wall that we have there is not just any wall, it's a wall that's actually weaponized and has a kill strip in front of it. And the peculiar thing is that wall wasn't built by that island state but it was to keep people out, but it was built by that other country to prevent its own citizens from running away. Now, that island state, that city I was living in, was West Berlin, and was surrounded by East Germany in the era of the Cold War. Right? And it felt to me, as a six-year-old, as if I was really in that eye on the of a hurricane. Right? This very uneasy feeling. There are two things that I learned from this, and it turns out that Berlin actually has more bridges than Venice. The first one that I really learned and took to heart is, bridges are a really good thing. Right? Bridges connect places, but most of all, bridges connect people. And so does our cultural heritage. So regardless of where you go, where you're born, what your economic interests are, what your societal interests are, what your political interests might be, or what your religion might be, there's something in your past that you're going to be proud of. Once that exists, we get to talk, right? we get to communicate, we can build empathy. And once that is in place, we can actually move our entire planet forward. So, the first item for my bucket list was really back then, well, I want to build bridges when I grew up. Uh, the second one was, well, I want to really preserve and work with world cultural heritage. So that was six years old. When I was nine, I really uh, had reoriented slightly, was looking outward, and I really wanted to be Neil Armstrong <laughs> and uh, go to the moon and explore Mars and really then travel the galaxies, right? Bucket list item number three. And then, when I was 12, incidentally, this happened to be the ages of my own children now, I really wanted to be Jacques Cousteau, exploring the world, the depths of the oceans, the beauty of our natural habitats, but also the shipwrecks that might lie beneath the surface. Right? Now, a couple of years went by, and I had to figure out how to really accomplish was what was on my bucket list. And the first thing I've, I did, I became a computer scientist. And as computer scientists, we get to digitally connect people. Right? We're doing this right now uh, quite regularly. Uh, then I became an educator, because with science, techni technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, really leveraging the left and right hand of the brain and working with these amazing, talented students, right? we get to move mountains, literally. The challenge was how do you build bridges beyond that, physically, structurally. Uh, for that, I took a shortcut. 
I got married, and my wife is a structural engineer. So, <laughs> which means digitally and physically, the bucket list number one was we were addressing, right? So that was the first part of my talk. The second one is, well, how do we address bucket list item number two, world cultural heritage? And I'm going to tell you a little story there about how we are approaching this right now uh, in our research group and how our students really help push this. So I get excited every day I come in the office because something amazing has happened. So, UNESCO defines world cultural heritage as our legacy from the past, what we live with today and what we pass on to future generations, a legacy that really embodies human imagination, ingenuity, innovation, right? Yet a legacy that's under constant attack by man-made and natural disasters, extreme events that literally within the blink of an eye get to reshape and can reshape what we get to pass on to future generations. So the question is, can we use STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and create a methodology, right, where we acquire, we curate, where we analyze, process, and then disseminate information in a close to fashion, where every single step informs the next, and we get to learn from it in very productive terms. So imagine, right now, we had an idea throughout the text X talks today to build your own drone. print that platform overnight, right? Take it off tomorrow morning, instrument it with its brain, its controller, add a battery, add motors and props, and then take to the sky after you've attached a sensor that actually allows you to image information about the environment that you live in, to document your environment through data, which then allows you to tell a story. Imagine you had this range of different platforms as they dispose of like motor motor is fixed, lighter than air platform that really allow us to get the right sensor to the right location at the right time, to collect information that might be perishable, such as the 2014 Napa Valley earthquake, which generated a billion dollars in damage in under 60 seconds. Right? So we're able to collect information that helped us to assess the infrastructure, eventually it will help save lives, but also rebuild it. Now imagine you could collect data from the sky, from the ground, and from the water. Right? Imagine you could capture the beauty of our built environment in image, in video, and in other forms. And it takes this data with you. And then in the evening, you sit down and build a digital surrogate that captures the geometry, but also the materials of that particular artifact you're interested in. And then use that digital surrogate to simulate how it would respond to extreme events. Sometimes. But now imagine you could do that with a large scale, all the way down to the tiny scale. So from the macro to micro scale, giving us context, giving us content, allowing us to literally take in the grand view, but then dial down to the finest detail of the Like to really appreciate the beauty of the environment. But now imagine you could do that at a level of detail that we can make engineering decisions, hard decisions, right, on how to preserve our engineering, or our engineering environment. On top of that, imagine it could do that at a level of resolution that suddenly becomes exciting to all of us to go to these places, right? Where we all become stakeholders. And now imagine we could push all of that data which is being acquired back into our virtual reality environments that we're building today to literally allow you to step into the arena of scientific discovery and experience what's out there firsthand with 2020 vision, no mosquito bites, right? I'm really feeling good about it. Now imagine you could push all this data back into the palm of your hand. And wherever you go, explore what the environment around you looks like. To literally touch the surface, to look beyond it, and maybe even interact with one of your largest and greatest idols, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, in person. Now imagine we could take that data and share it with the world, crowdsource it, so all of us can study it, contribute towards it, help analyze it, build a much more comprehensive collection of information, and then take that data back and cast it back into a physical artifact. So this, we need to stop imagining. So imagine this is and this is where we are. So, with this in mind, we can actually travel the world. We can study art, we can establish the state of health, we can study architecture, 
we can study archaeology using baseline information, using the data that has been acquired, and determining how it has changed over time. So I hope I have convinced you to become a custodian, a steward, a guardian of world cultural heritage. But if that's not enough, this is why you should really care on top of it. If you look at disruptive technologies that are emerging right now, that are completely going to transform our planet, the first and foremost one is big data, right? making the right decision because we are well informed. The next one is robotics and drones, right? They're completely changing how we are moving information, how we are moving products around. Uh, on top of that, we might have the Internet of Things, sensor networks that again allow us to, on a global scale, collect information, correlate it, and again make the right decisions, life-saving decisions, environmentally saving decisions when they need to be made. Many of us have worked with Bitcoin before, used it to pay online. These are cryptocurrencies that are using blockchain technology that's built to establish trust in transactions. And we're using this because we need to build trust in the data that we want to give you to work with and form an opinion from. You might think about 3D printing as a mechanism, right, to craft your digital assets back into a physical object or virtual reality and augmented reality to really interface. So all of these technologies are here to stay and really change our planet. And all of these technologies we either had to advance or completely reinvent to build and to create a future for the past. Now imagine this framework is actually in place, which it is. So this framework is in place and you can acquire, you can curate, analyze and disseminate information why don't we apply it to other areas? Now that bucket list item number two is slowly being touched. World cultural heritage, of course, is huge. Now, we worked with NASA and put some of the information, and we're literally able to walk on the surface of Mars. So we bypassed the moon initially, then we went back. <laughs> but, um, so we were able to stand on Mars, fully immersive, 3D, and actually drive the Mars rover, right from our lab. And our students were doing this. Right? Mind changing, but bucket list item number three. So we have been to Mars. And then we've gone a little bit further, thanks to NASA and the Hubble Space Telescope, scope to really, with powers of 10, explore the universe, literally staying inside it. It's truly transformational, right? So one thing on that bucket list, number four was elusive, so now it's getting rather frustrated a year ago. <laughs> The question was, right, can we dive the oceans of the world? Can we really understand them? And not just on one side for one documentary, but really do it holistically to understand marine life, understand corals and how they're impacted by today's global climate change. And they're such an impressively uh, sensitive right, indicator of climate change reacting, as we heard, to salinity, to temperature, and other changes in the environment causing these massive die-off events. So the question being, why did this happen? Why does this happen over, all over the world? But why are other places not as uh, hardly hit? Now, there was one of these movie moments that you might have seen where you have a dog and somebody said, squirrel, right? And that dog looks to the side. And that moment came to me last year when I got a call from a year, uh, from a very good friend now. He said, I, don't recall the conversation whatsoever. The one thing I remember it was Shifrex! And it brought back that six to 12 year old in me, right? This amazing uh, connection that we have to shipwrecks. And the stories they allow us to tell in regards to human expedition, human adventures, human tragedy, right? Being preserved right in front of our doorsteps, clearly, right here. So the question was can we build a global digital atlas? for starters, of shipwrecks, because regardless of who I turn to, 15 years or younger, they will be on the hook. I say, okay, shipwrecks are cool, right? I'm gonna go there. And when they go to these shipwrecks, we actually get to tell the story about the cultural heritage, the marine, maritime history aspect. But since all of these shipwrecks have been incorporated into the natural habitat, they have become coral reefs, we get to tell the story about corals. Where beforehand, our younger generation might have said, oh, Maybe, maybe that's not me, right? So we can literally do that mind fake of telling one story to tell another one. To our marine scientist colleagues, of course, we go and we tell the story about coral reefs. And by the way, there are shipwrecks too, right? So we've been working over the last year with our colleagues here, looking at ways to acquire 
information about the marine ecosystem and the shipwrecks that you see right here to tell the story. But most of all, get a baseline to better understand of what does our environment look like today. So a month from now, a year from now, we can go back and really understand the difference right, that has occurred. That's where we need to go for starters. So we made Bermuda actually our alpha site, right? our test site to grow this up much further. What you see here right now is the product of that labor of love. There are actually 3.5 billion data points being rendered right now in real time. So this is not a video. It's running on a tiny computer in the background, size of a laptop, uh, being controlled by one of my colleagues, Vid, showing us what Bermuda's submerged heritage looks like today. And he's actually annotating in real time a cannon right, that's on the Manila shipwreck. And the question that was posed to us at one point by one of our collaborators here from the Bermuda government was, how many cannons are there? And maybe did any disappear over the years? Right? Was there some looting on? How do we protect this environment? Right? So we're just actually annotating this right now live, working with 3.5 billion data points and filtering. So he actually can show us the cannons, right? He can literally engage in real-time forensics on shipwrecks. Right? So now imagine you can do this on your own terms, right? And that's what we're moving towards right now. So you can study your own ecosystems, you can understand them, you can become a steward, you can become a contributor. Because the next time you go diving, my challenge to you is take a camera, which it might be anyway, document that shipwreck, and work towards putting a pipe, working towards putting a pipeline in place that allows us to catch your photos, right, your prized possession, turn these photos into 3D models, and then use these 3D models to augment that larger ecosystem. But now imagine we could globally crowdsource that, so whoever goes into the water to take a photo actually helps us build a planetary scale map of human tragedy, human accomplishment, but most of all, these amazing ecosystems out there. So as it takes us through the Marie Celeste, um, we really get to appreciate what is there in ways we normally never could, because it's invisible to the naked eye unless you dive. And even if you dive, you have this very limited field of view, the window of opportunity uh, within these environments. So where we want to go is to really bring, right, the beauty of the environment that surrounds us to the surface. So in order to do this, as of 17 minutes and 30 seconds ago, <laughs> we have put online what we call the Bermuda 100 Challenge. And so we have challenged ourselves to start building out that first set of historic sites. Um, three of them are online right now including the Marie Celestia, uh, the Blanche King, and the Montana. The bottom line is if you go to bermuda.100.ucsd.edu, you will be able to see the first set of sites. And our invitation to you, since the last one we saw was the Marie Celestia, a steam-powered paddle boat that ran aground and through that created its own legacy in Bermuda. Right, to join us on that voyage of exploration and discovery. And really, our call to you is, let's do this full steam ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Amazing, isn't it?